Hey y'all, I'm on beautiful island of Motomoka, or the island of flax fibers. So flax is a very common plant around here. You might remember me mentioning it when I was talking about which habitats penguins prefer. And it completely surrounds the island. So the Maori people used to come here, collect the flax, and use the fibers of it, use, uh, use the materials from the flax to make a lot of different things. Baskets, clothes, uh, help sealing housing, uh, using it kind of as rope, all that sort of stuff, because it's a very strong plant. And you can hear a teke calling above me. That's called a teke because the sound it makes. Yeah, so that's a teke or a saddleback. It's a species that was reintroduced to this island after it was originally reduced down to just one group of islands. Since then, a lot of them have been re-released by the Department of Conservation and by the Auckland Zoo. So they breed them in captivity and then spread them to other islands or otherwise just collect them from the wild and move them to a different place. And they'll pretty much just stay on the islands you put them. And that's to help if, you know, a storm ruins one of the islands, you don't lose the entire species. So why do I sound winded? Well, that's because I am. I am very winded. That's a very steep island that we have to hike across every day, and I'll go over what we're doing with that in just a minute. But the reason it's steep is because it's a volcano. Like most islands, and even the mainland of Aotearoa, New Zealand, volcanoes. So that's what this is. It was initially pretty barren volcanic rock, but as you can see, it's pretty densely vegetated now. And the way it became of that was from seabird poop. So you have to get the nutrients from somewhere. Something has to contribute those nutrients to allow all this vegetation to grow here. And originally, there would be some nutrients in the volcanic ash, volcanic rock. As it's rising out of the ocean, you might have some plankton decay and all that sort of stuff. But that was millions of years ago. So how do we get the modern nutrients? It's pretty much all from seabirds. It's from the penguins, the petrels, and the shearwaters that nest on this island. And so why am I hiking up this? Well, because the hut's on the west coast, in the west bay, and we're heading to the south cove, where we will be attaching trackers to penguins, to penguins, to little Kurora. And the way we ended up with this little project, it's actually a bit of an accident. That happens sometimes. And basically, it comes down to one of the most common misconceptions in biology and in environmental work. The assumption is more or less that we know the basics, the big questions, about pretty much every major species pretty much every major group of animals. That's simply not true. It's very true for some species that can usually be grouped into two different categories. Either the ones that, number one, everyone wants to work with, or number two, are easily accessible. That's where probably 95 to 99% of the studies of animals are. Either the ones everyone wants to work with, or the ones that are really easy to work with. So category one, the ones that everyone wants to work with. You have elephants. They're not particularly easy to work with because they're dangerous and they're in Africa, which has a number of infrastructure issues related to that. But everyone wants to work with them. Everyone likes elephants, so there's a lot of research done on them. And then uh, the Asian elephant, there's just a lot of people around because that's the most densely populated area of the world, South Asia. And also because they're interesting. People like them. People like elephants. They want to work with elephants. They have really interesting qualities like their personalities, their intelligence, and their group dynamics, the way they interact as a group. Those make them really attractive to study. Another example, emperor penguins. Very difficult to work with because they breed in the heart of winter in, in Antarctica, but everyone likes them. They seem to be the most extreme version of life living in such an inhospitable place and doing really well there. They aren't struggling to survive. They are absolutely thriving. So that's very interesting to people. Plus, they're cute. They look like butlers. They look like they're wearing a tuxedo. They walk upright like us. People just really want to work with emperor penguins because of those reasons. So that's category one, the ones that are interesting in one way or another. And category two is the ones that are easy to work with. So those are going to be the ones that we either try to look for some medical explanations, like we use pigs for a lot of medical research, guinea pigs for a lot of medical research. That's where the term being a guinea pig comes from. Rabbits, mice, you've heard of lab rats all that sort of stuff. They're the ones that are easy to work with because we have tons of them lying around. Or you have ones that just happen to live in easily accessible places. Like pretty much every species in Britain has been discovered because it's such a densely populated and highly educated place that they have lots of researchers out there researching very few species in a very small area. So we have lots of information on British animals, British plants. Oh, gotta duck under that. Yeah, and then domesticated species, cows, pigs, chickens, all that sort of stuff. And that's where the misconception comes in. There's a lot of species we know virtually nothing about. And it's not just small things like beetles. It's big things and important things like seabirds. Particularly here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, or in other places with a lot of offshore islands. Sometimes they can be tough to access. 
They aren't always especially beautiful animals. I mean, the penguins are pretty cute, but even with the penguins, almost all the research is done in two colonies because one is super accessible and a major tourist destination in Australia, though, again, the debate about whether those are the same species, and then the other in the South Island in New Zealand, where it's just a large colony. So we've been having this debate ever since I started. There's no research on penguins up here. There's very limited research. Most of it is student projects. There aren't any major or long-term projects on them, and not a lot is known. And that's what brings us here. So a few weeks ago, we were on a totally unrelated project. It was just to see what lives on these islands. These islands that have been variously occupied or used for harvest for hundreds of years. They are some of the first islands to have been arrived on by Māori explorers. And so we've known of their existence. We know some of the species that live on them, but it's not well documented and people very rarely come here. So not a lot was known about them, and we came out here just to see what species are here. And we documented some stuff that was new to science. Uh, we found a little shearwater they hadn't been seen here before. Uh, we found flesh-footed shearwaters to be much more common than thought. Uh, we confirmed there are a lot of oe, or the gray-faced petrels, all around. Um, but the most important thing, and what brings us on this trip, is one of the beaches that we're hanging out on trying to get fluttering shearwaters to land, which another finding, we didn't find any fluttering shearwaters, even though they were thought to be here. So again, we don't always know everything. There's a lot of gaps in science, especially in these difficult to reach places. So one of those beaches, we were trying to get fluttering shearwaters to land at us. You just play a recording and they pretty much just land on you. They land right next to you, land on the recorder and just hang out. We couldn't get any of them to land. But while we were hanging out there, we were noticing tons of Corora just walking right by us. And that's where I got some of those videos and pictures from the other trip was on that one beach. In particular, they sort of funneled into three different areas. And those areas we've named the rock hopper, the highway, and the gully. So you can see how dense the burrows are here. There's just holes everywhere. There's some over there, some over there. And unfortunately, when we were on our last trip, uh, one of us took a bad step and it collapsed in this burrow. So we took apart one of the nest boxes and put that over the top so that this chick right here wouldn't be too badly affected. And as you can see, it's still alive nearly a month later. It's still doing fine. Parents are still visiting it. Um, so putting this cover right here really helped fix it. But ideally, we wouldn't collapse any burrows. It was kind of unfortunate. We didn't realize there was a burrow in this point and someone stepped. And you can see how shallow it is. It's really easy to collapse a burrow accidentally like that. So we put this little cover on it so that it still remains dark. And then the entrance to the burrow is off to the side. So there's not a problem of jamming that up. But yeah, the parents are able to get in there, feed the chick. The chick's doing fine and is getting about to fledging age or the age that will be leaving the burrow. So just now getting to the other side of the island and I am absolutely wiped out. I almost feel like football and rugby were better preparation for this work than actual science classes. Yeah, it's a, it's tiring work on some of these islands. They're very steep, very slippery. You're on cliff sides. It's, um, it's some intense physical work for sure. All right, and so this is the beach that we've been catching the penguins at. This is where they've been coming ashore. So this right here is what we call the sandy bit that leads up into the gully or the little stream that comes running down the mountain whenever it's raining. And right there you can see the little cave that a lot of them like to go to when we first visited, but we haven't seen any on this trip. And coming along the shore right here and we get to what we call the highway, which is just a little crack in the rocks that they like to go up. And the crack continues right here. And then they follow up this little flatter bit off into the flax, into the vegetation. And then bit further along is what we call rock hopper. So that's when they come ashore and they hop over all these little rocks and there's a small little uh, a little ramp right here that's still kind of steep and they have to hop up and then come up to the same plateau and into the vegetation. So what we like to do is kind of sit on those cliffs right over there so they can't see us so well because they only come on shore when it's pitch black so it'll be pretty dark pretty difficult for them to see us if they don't know we're here so we just try to stay quiet turn off the lights and wait there until some of them pop up and then catch them. Still a bit bright out. We've got maybe like three or four hours until the penguins start coming out. So I'm just gonna go for a bit of a snorkel out here, have a little bit of fun, dry off, and we're gonna have dinner because we work late into the night, uh, one or two in the morning, because that's when the penguins stop coming in. So we don't just leave, you know, we don't clock out at 5 p.m. Uh, that's just not possible in this kind of work. So what we've been doing is working till 1 or 2 p.m., hike back to the hut, which is like 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how tired we are, how rainy, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then just pass out, wake up really late in the morning, uh, hang out during the day, get everything ready for the night work, and then we come out here and start chasing penguins at about 8 or 9 at night. And that'll go right back through to 1 or 2 in the morning, and the cycle repeats. And so just had a good snorkel around, it did some swimming, checked out the wildlife, uh, found out that some of the coves have lots of kinnebarons, as you can see by the stingray right there, but for the most part it was a healthy kelp forest. So those kinnebarons come around it when 
the lobsters that usually eat the kinna have all been taken by humans for, for eating, essentially, uh, and then the kinna are allowed to thrive, and they eat the kelp forest and kind of wipe out this habitat. A couple days we were out there, the conservation dogs came by to visit us. Uh, their names were Willie and Ahu, Ahu meaning spot in Maori, which is, I think, the most adorable name. Uh, Adeli right there is a, a vet, so she just kind of instinctually checks on the dog's leg to make sure that Ahu right there is doing fine. But yeah, Ahu meaning spot, pretty cute name right there. And so what conservation dogs do is they assist with different conservation projects. And in this case, Willie and Ahu came out to this island to check for any rodents that had made it onto the island. Because the next island over is covered in rats, and it's well within swimming distance, so it wouldn't be unreasonable to think that some rats might swim across. So these dogs have been trained their entire life to search out rats, mice, uh, stoats, ferrets, any mammals that could cause harm to the bird life. And since Motomoka is a predator-free island, it's very important it stay in that state so that all the birds there can continue living, can continue thriving on this island. So Willie and Ahu are really important players in that project to make sure that no rodents are getting out there and killing the wildlife. So that's what they were out there for two days doing, just smelling all around the island, making sure that there's nothing damaging the wildlife. Thanks for watching. Our next video is going to be about the night work. So that's catching the penguins, sticking trackers on them, taking their measurements, all that sort of stuff, just so that this wasn't too much in one video. So next one, all the exciting penguin stuff.